Hey, since I was talking about Stoner Witch, and I'm probably going to talk about Stag and Honky and Prick, I thought I would talk about my signal chain for those records. It kind of changed a little bit. And also usage during the live situation, since there was tons of touring. Um, I've still got some of the stuff that I used, and I'd like to share it with you guys so you can take a look at it. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is my mainstay for recording and touring. And what I've got here is this SVT2P preamp. You can see it right there. And this is a really cool little unit because Ampeg basically took the preamp from an SVT without the 150 pound chassis and all the tube amps and they stuck it in a preamp. And it's the only thing that's different is they added a graphic EQ, which I never used, but they have all the frequency notches and everything. And you can also, you've got a direct out here, which was a great feature that I used constantly on tour. And for power, I used to use these Ampeg solid state power amps, which I could not even find a picture of, but I think they were 1200 watt power amps and I had two of them. So it was 650 watts per channel. The way that I used to run it was when I had, uh, we got to the point where I was using four SVT cabs. It sounds pretty crazy and it was, but the cool thing was if I was using four of them, I'd have the two center ones in mono and then I was using a digital delay and I had it really short, like one side was eight mils, the other side was 10 mils. And so it just created this massive sound. And most of the time I would use three or two, kind of went up and down according to the places that we were playing, but it sure was fun to use four of them. There's a, uh, I think on Lollapalooza I was using three and there's some video out there of, um, there's two and then there's one laying horizontal on top. So it was excessive, but I used every single part of it and it was loud and a fairly robust bass tone. This Ampeg stuff was produced, I think in 1995, 1994 maybe. And I got a hookup with uh, St. Louis Music who'd bought Ampeg. And so um, I had an artist endorsement. I never did any advertising for them or anything like that. So. I think they sent it to maybe Guitar Center on Sunset and um, I had bought this by myself and then they supplied the two gigantic power amps and I think we threw the whole thing into a Mesa Boogie rack which came from maybe Mesa Boogie on Sunset or something like that. But the whole unit was, was self-contained, monstrously loud and on wheels, which is exactly what you want. So I couldn't even find a picture of the Ampeg power amps, but they definitely made them for a while. I don't know who owns Ampeg at this point, but the Melvin still may have those power amps. I don't know, but they were really good. So I'm going to talk about some of this other stuff, the actual signal path and the way that worked uh, right now. The way the signal chain started was basically everything went right in here first, which is a Roger Meyer Voodoo Bass Box. Roger Meyer Voodoo Bass Box. And this thing is, for bass players out there, this is the most amazing little box. It just makes your bass sound absolutely gigantic. And the cool thing about it is it's got two outs on it so you can split the signal right out of it, which is exactly what I did. So I had a direct chain going to the, um, I had a direct chain going to the digital delay to split the signal, went into a tuner first, split it, went to a digital delay, and then went to the power amps after that. And then everything after the Voodoo Bass Box went through this, which was able to have a fail safe uh, in case the entire rig went down, I would still have the exact sound coming out of the PA. So 
this was a pretty bulletproof way to do things um, to ensure that the sig there was no signal loss regardless of anything. And of course, bass players know that this is an amazing little box right here. And um, it's also good for putting drums, vocals, absolutely everything. This 90s version of it is just really a perfect little machine. It's like an amp in a little box. I've had this so long, I don't remember where I got it from. I would imagine that I probably got it from either Guitar Center or maybe someplace in London even. I'm not really sure. Probably sometime in the 90s, like 93, maybe I think. This Voodoo Bass Box I got directly from Roger Mayer. You could mail order them. And he's famous for being the guy who built effects for Jimi Hendrix. And he built a really nice uh, reissue of the Univibe that he made for Jimi Hendrix. And I've used that on lots of stuff. All my records, it got used on um, At the Stake on uh, Stoner Witch. And I think also The Bit has it at the end on Stag, which I will talk about later. But um, this version is the original version, and this is the one that you want. Some of the circuitry got changed a little bit for the further versions of this, but this is the one you want, the early first version of it. And this is from like 1993 or 4, I think. Through Joe Barisi, there was some kind of hookup with DOD effects. Um, they made this thing called the Meat Box, and I think eventually they made like a, a box for Buzz and something else. But Joe Barisi set the whole thing up, and legend has it that DOD actually stands for Donny Osmond Digital, because this is made in, I think these were made in Provo. And so I had this in the chain also, and it's got a sub octave on it, which is really just insane sounding. It basically sounds like a gravel dump truck emptying out. So it is colored exactly like meat, which is really cool. And these things were really cheap when they came out. They might still be really cheap. And inside, I think there's still, it has a parental advisory sticker. And then I thought that there were some fly stickers in here. Oh yeah, here they are. This is very cool. Fly stickers to go on the meat. So this is a cool little box. And bass players, if you can find this and you like drony or just any, you can put anything through this and make it sound completely insane. So I think this got used on, oh, it actually has a little fly sticker right on it. So I used one of the stickers. So you can use this on anything to make it sound completely hideous and offensive. So it's a valuable box. And then there was this other one that we could have gotten any of the DOD stuff that we wanted. I wanted the meat box and the supersonic stereo flanger, which got used live occasionally. And the great thing about this flanger is the speed of it is so insanely slow. It's, it's like the, the slowest hardware flanger I've ever heard. So this is a valuable box too. And it's got little rockets on it because it's a supersonic flanger. It is in fact stereo also. Those boxes would have been like in the from the mid 90s or something like that. Even the price is on it still, I think. $119 for this. So I guess it wasn't that cheap, but these were kind of limited and fun. So these boxes, I use some of them more or less live and in the studio, just depending on what the situation called for. Typically, I took kind of disposable stuff on tour with me and I had this basic setup with the preamp, two power amps, uh, the Voodoo bass box and the Sans amp. And then every once in a while I would augment it with some other stuff, but typically 
I had the same stuff that I took out all the time. Uh, one other thing that I did always take out was this uh, Boss bass synthesizer box. And because this thing, you could make really crazy sounds with it. So when we were making a racket on stage, it was nice to just flip this thing on. And then on Stag, there's an envelope filter sound, which is actually the Love Tone meatball box. But this simulated the sound of the meatball box really well. And was more or less disposable at the time. Probably picked this up at Guitar Center. I'm not sure if they still make this one. I think they just came out with a new guitar synthesizer box that's supposed to be really cool. So this is a great little box, mid 90s uh, bass synthesizer box. I absolutely recommend it. And it also, you can do stereo out stuff with it. Um, Nice little box, amazing, effectively like Boss synthesizer chips in it, which are, which is Roland, so it's great. Next thing I'm going to talk about is this box here, which is Electroharmonics Black Finger. It actually runs on two 9-volt batteries, so it needs 18 volts to power the thing. And this thing has such a great tone to it. It's pretty incredible. I've used it on all kinds of stuff. And I found this in, I think, like a, some kind of a used music shop, I think, in Iowa or someplace sort of in the Midwest when we were on tour. And um, it had a sticker on it that said, does not work, $15 or $20 or something like that. And I just looked at it and I thought, I can fix that thing probably because as a 15 year old, one of the first things, one of the first effects I had was a thing called a screaming tree, which Electroharmonics made. And when Electroharmonics first started making effects pedals, you could either buy the kit for like $25 or you could buy the thing completely made for $45 or something like that. And since I built my first stereo, I thought to myself, well, I can build a guitar pedal. So um, I had a screaming tree and I had something called an LPB1, which supposedly made your amplifier 10 times louder. So I got both of those kits for $25 and, and built them. But anyway, this, um, sure enough, I got it into a hotel room or something and popped it open and saw that just the the solder joint to the output was basically broken. That was the only thing that was wrong with it. So when I got my hands on a soldering iron, I fixed it in three minutes and I got a black finger for like $15. So I was very excited. This is a great box for bass, for vocals, for guitar, for everything. And you can, it's a little noisy, but you can squash the crap out of anything you put in it. And it just has a beautiful tone to it. It's really, really a wonderful little thing. And I've used it a ton on all my solo stuff. And I think it got used on some Melvin stuff too, eventually in the studio, just monkeying around with things. Next, I'm gonna get into the Love Tone stuff of which I have almost every pedal that they made. Love Tone was a company English company in the mid 90s. I read about them in an English guitar magazine and uh, called them up and they said, yeah, buy our stuff. So they came over to my house in London and they brought all of their boxes. They were super nice guys. One, one guy was called Vlad, the other guy was called uh, Don Coggins was the designer. And um, so they brought over four boxes. I think they brought over uh, Big Cheese, a Brown Source, Wobulator, and a Meatball. And they came over and hung out for a while. They were actually, they had all of the pedals on their famous pedal board, which I ended up buying. And uh, so they were just like, knock yourself out. And every single thing 
I tried was absolutely amazing and I bought all four of them on the spot. I had to wait for them to build them for me. Anyway, the Big Cheese is a, this is a legendary pedal and I have number 177 and this is really the ultimate fuzz. Um, there's been a few knockoffs of it and those companies know who they are. And then there's Dan Coggins, who was the designer of this, went on to become the designer for Thorpey FX in the UK. And they do kind of a revamp, reissue of this. It might be called the Field Marshal. Uh, sorry if I'm getting that wrong, but if you want love tone quality designs made by the guy who actually built this stuff, go to Thorpey FX and just read about the stuff that Dan is doing over there. The Big Cheese actually got used on the album Honky on the song Lovely Butterflies. So if you want that bass, that gnarly bass sound, this is how you get it. You get it with this or the Field Marshal. I don't have one of those yet, but I probably will get one. And look, it's still in, it's still in cheese mode. So this pedal's awesome. Occasionally, very occasionally, I would take this out on tour, but uh, with the Melvins in the mid '90s, but not. It, it had it had to be a pretty controlled environment because these things are basically kind of like gold dust in a sense. This one is the legendary meatball box which is kind of like their love tones take on a mutron just like an envelope filter like i was talking about before and uh this is i mean just it's beautiful the way that it's made this one's in pretty much perfect condition i uh, never took it anywhere other than a recording studio i've got serial number 298 and it's got Dan's initials in there, DJ, DJ PC. And it's got the date that it was made, which is 1997. I mean, you can just look at how this is made. It's spectacular, really a beautiful design. And it sounds absolutely amazing. And you can trigger it and do all kinds of stuff with it. And this is the famous, uh, envelope filter sound on tipping the lion um, so you Melvin's fans know exactly what that is box is still in really nice shape still have the instructions and everything so these got looked after this is the doppelganger uh, serial number 0138 and this is another incredible pedal from them and they have reissued, Thorpe FX has reissued this one as the Pulse Doppler, I believe. And it's even in the same colors. So once again, this I only ever use this in the recording studio. I've used this on, this probably got used on a variety of Melvin stuff in the studio. There was a point where once I had Kind of acquired all this stuff I brought it definitely on stag um, I'm not sure if I had this stuff for stone or witch but by the time we were doing stag I had this and I just handed them all to Joe Barisi and said look at this stuff and I think he just ended up buying all of them also but once again I mean it's just so cleanly and perfectly made and just sounds absolutely Amazing. I mean, this is the ultimate double phaser. It's even got, it's got two LFOs in it. So um, this is an awesome box and uh, used on all my stuff. And like I said, some Melvin stuff. And when you use these boxes in combination, you'd get really amazing sounding stuff. Like using the meatball with the wobulator, which I'm going to show you now was a really great thing to do or 
plugging them all in in a chain and um, taking all the outputs and, and uh, messing with them in a mix was really eye-opening. They just had such a, they have such a transparent sound to them. It's real, they're, they're special boxes, absolutely. This one is the Wobulator and it's basically a dual tremolo box. And I've got serial number 25, I think. So this is a really early one. The very early ones were this color. They were green and yellow. Using this with a meatball or the, or the um, doppelganger, you just got crazy, amazing sounds out of it. And it was also really cool to reamp stuff with. Um, all kinds of stuff got put through this on the uh, stag record, which I will talk about at some point. So these are just the main sort of things that got used during my time with the Melvins in the studio, mainly. Um, and this other stuff I took out live, the boss stuff, the DOD stuff. Roger Mayer thing and those were sort of my mainstays for that particular tone along with um, along with a Fender P bass I think I had Rio Grande pickups in it Fender built me a few basses and uh, they kind of I had a 63 Fiesta Red P bass that was my first bass I bought it in London in 93 I think and then I had the custom shop I got a hookup with the custom shop and they made me a couple of copies of that base one was a uh, kind of a robin's egg blue color and then there was a green one um, forget the name of the color you know and I, I'm not a bass player so uh, I was the last one to go was the 63 Fiesta Red and actually um, somebody who Melvin's played with, I can't remember the name of the band he was in, but I think we played in Detroit and his, his band opened, um, often there were local bands opening the shows and I put it on eBay, I think back in, I don't know, early days of eBay, 2001 or two or something. And, uh, he sent me a message and said, are you Mark Dutram? Is this your bass? And I said, yes. And he was basically very excited and, and, you know, wanted to buy it and was very enthusiastic and glad to get it. So I'm glad that it uh, went to a, a happy owner. And um, yeah, if you're out there, send me a picture of it. I'd like to, like to see it again.